Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see all of your beautiful and handsome faces here at Echo Community Church. Now, I, I believe most of the crowd today is going to be one of two groups of people. Either you are normally out 11 a.m., or you forgot your iPhone didn't skip over the hour or something like that, and the hour that you lost in sleep is going to bring you to the 11 a.m. service. So, either way, welcome. Good to see all of your awesome faces here. And I just want to give a quick shout out to our people. I don't know if you noticed this. I hope, I certainly hope you did. But our lobby does have a little bit of a different decor vibe to it. It's not 100% finished yet. But I know the final project is going to look great. And it already looks awesome. Quick shout out to Havila and Joe and Leo and Doug and Mr. Paul who came by this week. Spent several days here making that lobby look really good for us. So... Big shout out to you guys. I think most of them are here. I think Doug decided to sleep in today, but either way, we'll forgive him. I promise. So either way, it's great to be here at Echo Community Church. I'm looking forward to everything Jesus has planned for this service, and I'm looking forward to see how he's going to teach us how to continue to be and make disciples of Jesus. So why don't we go ahead and start this service with some singing. So if you're willing and able, will you stand with me this morning? Keith and the team are about to lead us in a couple of songs, but let's join with them in our hearts and our minds uh, and our souls this morning as we embrace Jesus, because he's worthy of our worship, he's worthy of our praise, and I certainly want to worship him. So, Keith and the team, why don't you take it away? Oh, 
It appears this guitar is dead. Am I on back there? Please hold. So what we're going to do is we're going to switch back to this guitar. This is a new one you might have heard. This is called Always. I believe you gave sight to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life. I believe there were wonders and signs. And you're still the same. I believe every word that you said. I believe there are scars in your hands That your goodness is good without end And you'll never change I will tell of your wonders Sing of your grace The God of creation knows me by name The Lord is faithful Yesterday, now, and always Always Your mercy is mighty Age after age And all generations Will bow down and praise The Lord is faithful Yesterday, now, and always Always I believe you will come in the clouds I believe
thank you, Lord. You are faithful. Where else can we run but to you, O loving Father? You have the words of life. Our Father, Creator, you hold our hearts together. There's no one higher than you. Redeemer, Defender, our great and mighty Savior, there's no one higher than you. You are always with us, gracious to forgive us. By your power we've been set free. And Lord, we stand amazed in your presence. Astounded by your mercy and love. Our hands are lifted high in surrender. Your grace for me is always enough. There is no one higher than our God. There is no one greater than you. Let my life forever praise the glory of your name. There is no one higher than you. Majestic in wonder. Majestic. Down 
surrounded by your mercy and love. Our hands are lifted high in surrender. Your grace for me is always enough. And there is no one higher than our God. There is no one greater than you. Let my life forever praise the glory of your name. There is no one higher We're deeply convinced of that, Father, that you truly stand alone above all else, above all others. You have no colleagues. You have no team. You have no, you stand alone above greater and higher than all things. And we're thankful that you are willing to have relationship with us, the lowest of the low, the broken, the imperfect, the hopelessly flawed, even on our best day. And we thank you that you see us differently than we see us. You see us as lovely. You see us as right. You see us as perfect in Christ. You see us through the lens of Jesus. Lord, we need that same lens to be on our eyes that we can see you through a lens of Christ, that we can see others both our friends and those we don't get along with, that we can see through Jesus, that we can see ourselves through Jesus. And we confess to you today, we recognize we're spiritually bankrupt. We had it all. We lost it all. (laughs) Spiritually speaking, we don't have the ability to pay our ways out of the debt we've gotten into. Lord, we're dissatisfied with that. It grieves our heart. But that brings us to you, Jesus, and we come meekly and humbly to you today, seeking your forgiveness, your restoration, your ongoing work in our hearts. And there's a new appetite we have, God. We want, we're hungry and thirsty to be right and to do right according to your standards. You've given us, you've been merciful to us. We even realize that if we live that way, it may invite some form of distancing from people of the world, maybe even persecution, maybe even social and material consequences at times, but we're thankful because we know great is our reward in heaven. So today, God, we make ourselves open and vulnerable to your leadership in our lives. Help us to understand the Bible today as we study it this morning. Holy Spirit, we know what the work you're doing is making us aware of our need for Jesus, bringing us to him, and then through your work inside of us, you are, you're putting us back together in the way that we think, the way that we feel, the way that we choose and decide. You're putting us back together in the same manner that Jesus is already together. So that day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, we're becoming a little bit more like Jesus. And for that, we are grateful. And for that, we're supremely happy. For that, we know we are blessed. Lord, open our hearts and our ears that we can hear and change. May our hearts be good soil that the seed can fall into and grow. In your mighty name we pray, amen. Amen. So glad you're here this morning. Why don't you take a moment to say good morning to people sitting near you and students in grades 5, 6, 7, and 8. You can be dismissed to Club 58 with Pastor Zach.
thank you for ending on a minor chord. It makes me very sad. Let's talk about the wretchedness of the soul today. Yeah. Well, you know, monotone pitch. That's what I specialize in. <laughs> thank you to our team. I don't, I don't know if you appreciate sometimes the level of just musical giftedness that God has given, you know, to your, your guitar goes out and the way you rehearse the song and the voicings the way that you want it doesn't work. You just pick up another one and change everything on the fly and just make it go and get out of the way and let us get back into God's presence. That's a gift. And I'm thankful that our team is willing to bring the gifts that God's given them to benefit each other. That's what body is. Body is every part of our body physical body contributes and benefits from the rest of it. And that's God's idea for how faith community looks like, that we all are able to contribute, but we all are able to benefit from it too. And so we're thankful that you're here. We benefit from you being here, and I hope you benefit from us being here. We're going to continue our series on the Sermon on the Mount today. I do want to invite you to make sure that you uh, plan to be with us next Sunday. It is Friends and Family Day at Echo. For those of you that have experienced Friends and Family Day with us before, you, you've had a taste of what those mornings are. For those of you that might be uh, newer to our faith community, several times a year we plan Friends and Family Day. And what we do on those days is we invite people just from our faith community who aren't pastors or staff of this church necessarily, just people that just happen to live in this area and they're part of this faith community, we invite them to come and just share their story of how they came to know the Lord. Because everybody has a story. And no one is more or less spectacular than another. And I don't want you to be nervous if you come here thinking, is that a rite of passage at some point for me to really be accepted here? Do I have to sit on a chair on a Sunday and bear my... No, no, no. At the same time, you know, we think, it's, we think it's just a lovely thing to be able to hear about each other's stories. I always benefit when I hear somebody else just talk about how they came to know the Lord. And so next Sunday, you're going to get to hear uh, from Mandy and from Dr. Joe. You'll get to hear a little bit about their story and how they came to know the Lord. And so be praying for them this week because it's a different headspace to get into when you come to church knowing you're going to be standing or sitting up here talking to others than when you come prepared to listen. So pray for them this week that God will give them clarity and confidence and peace. Um, they'll be sharing at 9 at 11, so you'll be, get to hear, regardless of which service you come to, you'll get to hear both of their stories. Of course, after 9 o'clock, you can you know, enjoy coffee and snacks in the foyer. After 11, after 11 o'clock service, we're going to have Echo Eats, which I'm sorry for those of you that are online, we can't quite push it through the internet to get you the pizza and subs to your house. But uh, if you'll be with us next week after the 11 o'clock service, we're going to bring out some of our brand new tables that you helped us buy, and we're going to turn this into kind of a cafeteria, and we'll have pizza and subs and, and, and lunch for you out there. Um, no, co no cost to you. We're, the church is going to cover all that. Um, we just want to make it possible for you to stick around and get to know each other. It's, that's part of what getting to know each other is, is like in a faith community. And some of you are like, yes, we get to hang out with other people and get to know folks. And some of you are thinking, oh, no. Like this is, and that's okay. Both of those personalities are okay. God made both of those personalities and they're fine. So here's what I would say. If you're of the type that like, look kind of like your pastor who is like, ooh, big room, social. I want to find a corner and just find a quiet, safe space by myself. Come find a corner and a quiet space, safe space for yourself. That's completely fine. Those of you that are wired the other way, gently, kindly, go find some of those people and sit with them and start the conversation. And so those of us, we have to be like, okay, that's cool because we're all wired to want relationship and get to know people. And so I just want you to know that both of those types of personalities are okay. I'm not the guy that's going to be like, all right, go, go meet 50 people you don't know right now. Some of you get wired for that and others you want to go to the bathroom and get coffee at that point because that's, both of those personalities are okay. We need to eat. And there's other you know, gradations of that, but here's what I know. We're made to be in relationship with each other. We are a body. We're a family. And you matter to us. And you matter to me to fill. And how can I ever appreciate what God's done in your life and how, how you can add to my life if I never even have a conversation with you? And so these days allow us to do that. It's a great Sunday to invite somebody. I don't say bring somebody against their will, you know, hogtie them and bring them here even if they don't want to be here. Invite them. They might say yes or no, or they'll think about it. If they're being spiritual, they'll pray about it, right? But it's up to us to make the invitation. It's up to the other person to take you up on it. But it might be a, a nice Sunday 
to bring somebody with you to be able to just hear from. You all expect to hear from the pastor, but when you hear from people that aren't vocationally called to this, it just hits a little bit different. And so that's what next Sunday is going to be about. Hope you'll make plans to be with us. Bring somebody with us. We'll have a great time together. Let's talk about the Sermon on the Mount. Um, I hope now, by now, some of you were here last week. I realize you weren't all here. Last week, we looked at the whole thing. We actually considered all 111 verses of this sermon at one time. And it hits different than if you just chop it up in little pieces. Now, we're going to go back through and walk through it a little more slowly. If you would like access to uh, my notes, my research, some of the different resources that I looked at in pulling together today's sermon, you can scan the QR code and download it and have it. If that's not for you, you can just... Let it go right past you, but I, I, I know a lot of you use these and you found value in these, so I'm happy to share with you, so that encourages your own Bible study. But back to the Sermon on the Mount, there's three questions Jesus answers in this sermon. The questions aren't asked in the sermon, but after we look at the whole sermon together, there's three questions, I'm telling you, the three questions he's asked, or I'm sorry, the three questions he answers in this sermon have splintered people for 2,000 years. Because we're all answering these questions for ourselves. Churches corporately trying to answer these questions to their church family. Denominations and movements have tried to answer these questions. And unfortunately, I think we've unnecessarily muddled some very critical basic information. And the three questions that Jesus asks or answers, and there's more than these three, but I'm just going to land on these three. First one, he answers in this sermon, in these 111 verses, he gives you a pretty clear, evergreen answer to the question, what is genuine Christianity? What is it really? And the answer, in, in, in a nutshell, that he supplies for us is that Christianity is, at its root, a completely new and a different way of living than what is already normal and going on in the world. It's completely new. It's completely different. And the second component he talks about, true Christianity is, it's an inward change, something that happens inside of you in something the Bible calls your, the, the Greek word, the Bible is psyche. Have you heard that word before? Okay, thank you, James. I'm glad you have. I'm gonna work hard. I worked hard on the first service. Well, come on now. You all had at least one more hour than they did. Let's go, Okay. I need you to think. Greek word is psyche, the soul, the heart, the mind, your intellect, your will, your emotions. Jesus says Christianity starts with a change there. And it results in changed actions and behavior that radiate out of a change on the inside. You'll see that in all 111 verses of the Sermon on the Mount. Every topic he talks about, he's telling you what true Christianity is, what it really means to follow him, and how that's new and different from the world, specifically because Christianity starts from being right. And the evidence is we do right. And that's the reverse Quite candidly, that's the reverse from what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law taught then, and it's the reverse of almost every other world religion today. So every other world religion but Christianity is going to give you advice for how to do right. And if you do right, you'll ultimately be right, whether it's the pillars, whether it's the laws, whether it's good works, whether it's a pilgrimage. If you do all these things externally, it will trickle in and make you right. Only Christianity says uh, this is news, not advice. And only if you will come to the Lord and say, I'm not right, can he make you right, and then you'll be right. And if you are right, out of the rightness that lives inside of you through Christ, you will do right. So what is real Christianity? Jesus says it's a completely new and different way of living that starts on the inside and radiates out. Second question he asks and answers in this sermon really is, what is a real Christian supposed to be like, and what are we supposed to do? I think that's a very practical question. And I realize by your blank stares, maybe that hasn't ever resonated with you. But trust me, every church that's out there today is going to give you an answer of this. If you come to this church and you follow Jesus in this church, here's what we do. 
Here's what you're supposed to be. Here's the things that we say you should be really busy in and you should feel better about yourself if you're doing these things. And if you're not doing these things, you shouldn't be satisfied with that. Well, Jesus took a swing at that before we all did and he set the record straight. Here's what a real Christian is supposed to be and do. And he simply says it this way. You're supposed to be right according to God's standards. And you're supposed to do right according to God's standards. That's how you notice true Christianity. There are people who who are right and do right according to God's standards. And you can kind of sit up a little taller, but if you start thinking about it, you start to shrink a little bit because you'll come to the same conclusion the disciples did a couple years after this sermon. They wrestled with this and wrestled with this and wrestled with this. They heard Jesus say two things in the sermon that he kept saying. Come into the kingdom. Come into the kingdom. I have a new kingdom. I'm bringing in a new kingdom. It's God's kingdom. It's different from the kingdom of the world. Here's what it's like. Here's how people treat each other. Here's what their government is like. Here's how they feel about themselves. Here's how they relate to the king. Here's how they relate to their neighbors. Here's how they relate to money. Come on into this kingdom. Come inside the boundaries. And people are saying, this sounds really, really good. And he says, and then they say, well, how do we get in? And he says, here's the way you get in. You don't need a passport. You don't need a a negative COVID test. You don't need to be a certain age or a certain height. You don't have to take an exam. We just check. You don't have to have one of those little special smart keys that you get at the Marriott and you wave it by your door the third time it goes green and you get in, right? You don't have to have one of those. Here's your access. You have to be completely, perfectly righteous. And that's a, uh, now you're using Christian easy term. Okay, let me give you a common definition for righteousness. To be right and do right according to God's standards. That's what righteousness is. You are perfectly right on the inside and you are perfectly right on the outside. That's how you get in. So enter through the the narrow gate. Come on in. How do we get in? What does he say in chapter 5? He says, I tell you the truth. Unless your righteousness surpasses beyond that of the most righteous people you know, you can't enter through the narrow gate. But if your righteousness is perfect, you can come on in. And the disciples wrestle with this and wrestle with this and wrestle with this. And later on in Jesus' ministry, they finally say, Jesus, who then can be saved? Who can pass that test? You're inviting us in, and then you're reminding us that we don't meet the qualifications. That's mean, Jesus. You're saying there's cake over here for everyone to have, and and the perfect people can have the cake. Come look at it. Smell it. Salivate. Oh, but unless you're perfect, all you can do is look and see. You can never taste of it. Jesus, that's mean. Who can do this? And Jesus says, you know what? With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And so what does it mean to really be a Christian? Jesus says, you'll be right and you'll do right. And the third question that he answers is, well, then who really is a true Christian in God's eyes? And how can I know for sure if I am one? Now, even if you've not thought about the first two, I think a lot of us have wrestled with that last one. You might be here today or listening this morning thinking, I... I know I'm not a Christian, but I'm curious to hear what this dude has to say. I'm glad you're listening in, and I'm glad you're here. You might be in the category saying, I know I'm a Christian, and I really hope I'm right. (laughs) Or you might say, I'm not sure. I think I'm a Christian, but I'm not 100% sure. The Bible teaches very clearly that you can know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you're a Christian, that you don't have to go through your life perpetually worrying about if you died today, whether you're going to enter into heaven or be separated from Jesus. But think about the way Jesus ends this sermon. Dr. Joe and I were talking a little bit after last service. Dr. Joe is one of our elders here and has walked in a in a leadership and a support and a, and a Paul capacity in my life for years. And He was sharing with me about a time years ago when he taught a Bible class uh, in a larger church on the Sermon on the Mount. And he said the first week there were hundreds of people there and the room was packed. And as we went deeper and deeper and deeper into the sermon, the crowd got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. 
not because he's not an excellent teacher, but because the content and what Jesus was talking about, we want so desperately to soften it or change it or make it more stomachable. But if you really wrestle with it, it can be pretty tough by design. And the way Jesus ends, he starts the sermon by talking about being blessed. And he ends the sermon by saying, away from me, you evildoers. Do you remember that little anecdote he he? He, he first, at the end of his sermon, as he's getting ready to close, he says, so enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many enter that way, but enter through the narrow gate. For small is the great gate and narrow is the road which leads to life. And few there are that ever find it. And then he says this. Not everyone... I'm going to paraphrase, who shows up to the pearly gates with their little resume and their Marriott card expecting to gain access is going to get access. Only those who do the will of my father. He says, there will be many, not a few, not an isolate, many who will come up to the gates and they're going to be completely expecting to be let in. And they have a reason why they're expecting to get into heaven. And he reveals it to us. Many will come to me. And maybe you've heard this passage saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we? And now Jesus picks. He's not trying to put you in a theological crisis. He's trying to pick extreme examples of things we might think earn us heaven. Lord, Lord, uh, you know, I'm here. Uh, I need to get in now, please. It's, like, it's the same with the same type of attitude as when you paid for your room at the Marriott. Not like this has ever happened to me, but this is fresh in my mind. And they give you one of those little plastic things that's supposed to let you in your room. And you go up and you try and you try and it's not working. And it's never your fault. It is always their fault. And you go down to the, to the desk and there's a little bit of a, I paid for my room here. You're supposed to make this work. And you're, you're the one done an injustice to. You are now inconvenienced. Because why? On the basis of your payment that has cleared, you are entitled to access to that room. Which is why if they said to you, I'm so sorry, I guess, you, you know what? I guess you're just going to have to go find another hotel. You wouldn't handle that very well. Why? Because you paid the bill. Or at least you gave them your credit card and they put an $8 million hold on it in case you raid the mini fridge, right? Because there's $8 million of Snickers bars in there. And you feel a sense of injustice because you did the right thing. Well, this is the same attitude, if you can relate to that. This is the person he's describing shows up saying, Lord, Lord, hey, look, we prophesied in your name. We drove out demons. How many other people in the line have done that? We've performed miracles, I know, other than us and Oral Roberts and a few others. The list is very short. Therefore, let us in. And Jesus says, you know, paraphrasing again, oh, your entitled attitude that you think you're so spiritually wealthy, you paid your own bill, you've got a nice resume of things you've done, you think that's what I'm like? You think that's what I'm about? I don't know you. Away from me, you doers of evil. This is at the end of the sermon. He's basically saying there's three categories of people he's thinking about as he's teaching. He's thinking about lost people outside of the kingdom of heaven. And he wants them to know what it's like and how to get in. He's thinking about people who will come to him on that day who have been saved, who have been changed and transformed. But he's speaking to a third group too. He's thinking to people who think they're saved, but in fact they are not. And he leaves this sermon. The mic drop of this sermon is making you wonder, oh man, am I the one who thinks I'm going to heaven? but will be told, depart from me? Or am I the one who goes to heaven and he says, well done, enter in? He answers that question at the beginning of the sermon. It's almost like a circular thing. The end of the sermon pushes you back to the beginning. How do I know if I'm a true Christian? Because Jesus seems to indicate that there's such a thing as a 
an inauthentic Christian, a person who thinks they're saved when in fact they're not? How do I make sure that I have that resolved in my heart? And the simple answer Jesus gives is that real Christians are known by the attitudes of their hearts that trickles out in the way that they live. He supplies for us a complete answer to that question in the beginning of the sermon in the form of something called the Beatitudes. And you can't strip away any one of the Beatitudes. They're a process. They progress. These Beatitudes that Jesus provides for us, in fact, let me give you some, I think I gave you the three questions already. I'll skip that part. Let, let me, what do I mean by a Beatitude? A Beatitude is simply this. It's a statement. A beatitude is a statement that gives us a definition. Beatitudes are statements that define who, what kind of people are blessed people by God's standards. Now, blessed is a word we use a lot. Uh, if you watch any of the award shows on television, you watch the interviews with a player after a, a victory in a sports game, a lot of times you'll hear people, either they'll, how do you feel now that you won this award or you won this game? Oh, I'm just blessed. Well, in a way, yes, you are. You're probably blessed, at least the eye test says you're blessed by the way that the world decides who's blessed. Beatitudes are statements. There's about 30 of them in the Bible. There's other beatitudes than are one in Jesus' sermon. They're statements that inform us who God considers to be blessed. Now, I've used that word blessed a lot. What do we mean by blessed? It's tough to get a single word for it. New Testament was originally written in Greek. If we take that word, and Greek is a very specific language. English is very less, much less exact. Here's what the Greek word for blessed means. It's not just one word. It's a bunch of words put together. I call it a word salad. Uh, the word blessed means this. Supremely blissful. Uh, I don't know. We live in Baltimore County, and I interact with a lot of people, and I see a lot of people's faces. I don't know what percentage of people in Baltimore County have ever experienced even, uh, like, medium bliss, extra small bliss. I don't know. Okay, I'm German, and I realize I have a non-blissful resting face. I understand that. I'm working on this. Okay. Just to start, the word bless doesn't just mean blissful. That's not strong enough. It means supremely blissful. Supreme is what, you know, you've got grande. Uh, what's the one? Be up? Is there one less than grande? Tall, yeah. Okay. Tall, grande, venti, trenta. Just some of you know, you got to know trenta. Then you've got supreme. Yeah. You're thinking if Starbucks offered a supreme, I am in. It would cost you $41. So what Jesus is saying, of all the blissful feelings and people there are, there's a category of bliss that stands above all of them, and that is blessed. But that's still not strong enough of a word. It means to be not only supremely ha blissful, but supremely happy. And in the Greek word, if you go inside it, it's the, of all the words it uses to describe happiness, this one is at the top of the strength of their words. And it describes a type of happiness that means privileged beyond anything you can imagine. And when we think privileged, and I'm not trying to talk, uh, you know, I'm, I, that word has a different way that we can talk about it. We have talked about it. But at its root, a privilege is something that is extended to me. It's something that I'm given through really no, I, I might have earned it, it might not have. It's a privilege. It's not a right. It describes a type of bliss and happiness that is beyond anything you can imagine. Now, I hope at some point in your life, you've experienced happiness. I hope that each day you can experience happiness. I realize it's a feeling, it's an emotion, it's an idea, it's fleeting, it can be sporadic and maybe not constant. Jesus is going to give you some statements which says, when I look across humanity... And I assign and I identify and I recognize people who are blessed, supremely happy and blissful beyond anything they can imagine. These are the characteristics of those people. 
Christians in Jesus' estimation, those who are true followers of him, are blessed. They are supreme. They are privileged by God to enjoy and experience a happiness and a bliss that is supreme. That it is even beyond any of the, 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 the finest happiness you can experience on this earth. It's real and it's genuine. But then there's another level to that that's inaccessible outside of the Lord. And he says, blessed are. And then he lists some of these people and he uses these shocking contrasts. Jesus oftentimes would shock his listeners by pairing together ideas that you would never put together. Doesn't he use like light and dark a lot? He uses good and bad, righteous and unrighteousness. Uh, you know, um, you can go on and on and on. And, but man, the beginning of the Beatitudes is the same way. Here's what he does. He pairs blessedness with bankruptcy. He compares and contrasts. He assigns blessed to the person who grieves and mourns. Blessed is the person who experiences gnawing hunger and parched thirst. Blessed is the person who feels isolated. Blessed is the person who is falsely accused because of righteousness. Blessed is the person who's persecuted. And you're thinking this is sick. Certainly this must mean something other than what I hear. And in a way it does because to start talking about those things materially turns this whole thing into a social gospel. And that's what, not what Jesus is doing here. He's describing in these Beatitudes the process of salvation, of repentance, of forgiveness, of restoration, of healing, and then of the realities of living a counterculture in a world that doesn't understand and appreciate it. And if you start at the first beatitude and say, have I experienced this? Have I been there? It's going to lead you to the next one, which leads you to the next one, which leads you to the next one. Which... And in G with Jesus, being blessed is never about material things, or at least in general, it's not. Jesus describes blessedness as, as not as a result of a position or a possession. I want you to remember those two words that start with P. Because you see, the world says, you know who's blessed? Blessed are, not, blessed are the wealthy. Blessed are the well-fed. Blessed are the well-clothed. Blessed are those who are smiling and laughing and high-fiving and fist-bumping. The That's what blessedness looks like. Blessed are the popular. Blessed are those with wide social circles. Blessed are those with all the opportunities. We don't think blessedness looks like bankruptcy and hunger and grieving and hunger and thirst and uh, injustice. And we don't think, but Jesus pairs these two things together. So whatever does he mean? And he also says these are the evidences of a real work of the Holy Spirit in the heart of a genuine Christian. So what do we do with all of that mess? I hope I've raised enough tension that you're willing to listen to the next few minutes of how we unpack some of this stuff together. I'm going to be sharing out of the New International Version today um, and throughout the series on the Beatitudes simply because that's how I've committed these to memory. So I just want to stay within that today. So a shift a little bit. So I have NIV on my printouts and I have the NLT in front of me here. But let me just read, uh, read these next few verses to you and see if together we can have a little bit of a clear understanding about what is a true Christian? What are we supposed to do and to be? And how do I know? How do I know if I am, in fact, a genuine Christian? Um, that Jesus describes and you'll you'll I think you'll be relieved to know that Jesus describes the true Christian life not by what you possess not by what position you hold but it's all about your character it's about who you are who you're related to how you relate to them in a lot of cases about some truths that you understand that maybe not everybody does there's some realities that have gripped your heart that change the way that you think and it manifests itself in the character of your life. So here's what Jesus says. We'll just tackle a couple of these today. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. 
Blessed are the meek, and I'm going to plant this in your mind. Blessed are the meek, and he doesn't say the weak. Blessed are the meek. There's a difference between meek and weak. Okay? For they will inherit the earth. And the last one we'll look at today is blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And for each of these beatitudes, we're going to try and answer two little questions. One of them is, what does it mean to be that beatitude? What does it mean to be poor in spirit? What's it mean to mourn and grieve? What does it mean to be meek? And what does it mean to hunger and thirst for righteousness? The second question we'll try and answer is then why are you blessed if you, if you are that, if you experience that? So let's look, at the, let's look at the first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? I just want to say this. Here's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean to be poor in your bank account. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a different kind of poverty, and actually even the word poor in spirit is not quite as strong as the Greek language there. The Greek language there, it says, blessed are those who are spiritually bankrupt. That's what it talks about. Let me give you some word salad of a definition, and then we'll look at the ingredients. To be poor in spirit means this. Doesn't mean that you've given away all of your wealth to the church. It doesn't mean that you've decided to take a vow of poverty to live below your means and anything that you earn in life you give away to others. Because again, that would turn this into a social gospel and that's not what this is. To be poor in spirit means you have an ever-increasing awareness of your true condition. And that is that we are spiritually bankrupt in and of ourselves. It's having a mindset, having an understanding agreeing with the reality that at the end of the day, I am not only spiritually poor, I'm spiritually bankrupt. Let's just talk about bankruptcy for a second because nothing makes you happier that you got up today than coming to church to talk about bankruptcy. So let's talk about it for just a moment. You have to have a reference point. If we just think in terms of being spiritually poor and, and our jumping off point is how we understand finances, there's lots of different reasons why people might be, in terms of the world economics, poor. It could be by mismanagement. It could be by circumstances. It could be by crisis. Lots of different reasons. But if you're bankrupt, that indicates that you had enough. And then because of some set of circumstances and choices, you now have less than zero. And you no longer have the capacity to earn and buy your way out of that. And therefore, you are at the mercy of all of your creditors. Now, I realize in courts of law, we've gotten much more nuanced. There's different kinds and titles and types of bankruptcy. And there's different reasons why people go... On a very basic core level, at the time Jesus said this, it wasn't that complicated. If you were bankrupt, it meant it was worse than being poor. You owed. You, were, you had accrued for yourself debt that you no longer had enough years of your life to pay off. And you were at the mercy of your creditors. And what Jesus says is the blessedness is coming to a realization that you're in that place. And you're thinking, that's really morbid, Jesus. You mean you look at a person who just filed for spiritual bankruptcy and you say, congratulations. That's probably not the way that you think. If you have a friend or a family member that just filed for bankruptcy and you think, I want to do something that's going to encourage them, you would not do the following. You'd not go down to Target. First of all, if you go there without a list, you're going to come out of there. You might be in bankruptcy if you go in there without a list. You go in there, and you're like, you know what? I'm going to go over to the greeting card section. I'm going to write out a card, and you look through me. Ah, oh, here's the perfect one to send to my cousin who just filed for bankruptcy. And around the front, it reads, congratulations. On the inside, we're so thrilled for this new season in your life. And you're thinking, that's insensitive, pastor. That's mean. That's not a cause to celebrate. Jesus is not suggesting that it's a cause for celebration when you discover your bankruptcy. He's not describing that moment as good or fun or pleasant or painless. And yet he's saying a person who has an ever-increasing awareness of their spiritual bankruptcy what it does is if you have an ever-increasing awareness that that is triggering you on a blessable pathway. That's triggering within you the initial movement in your life spiritually that leads 
to a blessedness that results in you becoming a citizen of the kingdom of God. I, it's no secret to many of you that know me, I watch a lot of sports and I watch some ESPN and they have these documentaries they've done called 30 for 30. And one of the first ones that they did was a documentary simply called Broke, B-R-O-K-E. Maybe a few of you have seen it. It's basically a documentary that explains this crazy idea of how professional athletes who earned multiple millions of dollars years later would end up completely broken in bankruptcy. And the story follows the same formula. They had it all. They made some choices. They lost it all, and they lost so much that they didn't even have the ability to get themselves out of the debt they were in, and their only choice was to say, I've got to do something about my condition, and my only choice is to throw myself at the mercy of a judge who, by their position, can give me some form of a better pathway forward than what I have right now. And that process did not start until they realized I no longer have the assets, the resources, or the ability to get myself out of the hole I've dug for myself. And what Jesus says is that it's blessed if you can come to a place where you realize I'm not spiritually wealthy. I don't have a big bank account that I've accrued myself spiritually. I actually, I'm a spiritual debtor. I owe God because I've broken his law. And I might have tried, once it starts settling into my heart, how have I responded to that? Well, I've tried to live a good life, and I've tried to do good things, and I've tried to be nice, and I believe in karma or barma or Barney or whatever you believe in. Jesus says there's a blessedness that begins for a person who has an ever-increasing awareness that I, the true accountant who sees everything, when he accounts for my life, when the all-seeing eye of the Lord looks at our heart, not the one on your dollar bill, conspiracy theories, everything else, the real all-seeing eye, when he looks at our heart and he looks at our life, says, not only do you have a zero balance, you have a negative balance. And you don't have enough lives to give to pay that off. When you agree with what God sees, there's a moment of confession here. I confess I am a sinner. I can do nothing but sin. And that no good thing lives in me. Even my righteousness is like filthy rags. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't earn off this debt. I can't find an alternate path. There's one narrow path here. For me getting back on track. You have to have a reference point to understand if you're bankrupt. These athletes in broke, they'll go back and say this one had a $12 million a year salary, $30 million salary, $180 million net worth. And someone like me looks at that thinking, hundred. it takes real effort to go bankrupt <laughs> if you have $180 million. Because look at their reference point. They had it all, but they lost it all. Friends, that's our story. We as humans had it all, didn't we? Not me. I wasn't. If you're talking about the garden, I wasn't there. Had I been there, I wouldn't have eaten the apple. You'd have slipped on a banana peel at some point. And you've eaten an apple since then. We all have. But look at what we had. Do you understand what world God gave us? perfect. He created for us the most soul-satisfying environment to live in you could ever imagine. No work. Baltimore. No work. You know what your job was? Was run around with no clothes on and name animals. At least half of that sounds good. I won't deal with what half you think sounds good, right? You didn't even have to water the garden. Just watered itself. Animals, all of look at creation, how we related to creation. There was no pollution, drink from the streams. Animals got along. You didn't have to run away from a snake or a rhinoceros or any of the other sorceresses that were dangerous. 
Look at how people related to each other. There was no jealousy. There wasn't any, oh, I really need to guard my mind against sexual temptation. And there were no filthy imaginations. There were no rivalries. There were no wars. There were no bad neighbors. Yet, look at how we related to God. You didn't have to like close your eyes and tune in. He'd just come down and take a walk with you. How do I know what God's voice sounds like? Well, you didn't have to wonder. You could just, you, you knew. He just came down and talked to you. You lived in perfect, loving relationship with him. They could love him with all their heart, all their soul, all their strength. They could love their neighbors as themselves. Not a care in the world, not a worry in the world, nothing. There was no worry. There was no stress. There was no, oh, I just need to battle the bad things I want to do. There's the, you know, the, like the Tom and Jerry commercial. There's the good angel and the bad angel on my shoulder all the time, and I just drained from the fight. If only you could just kick the bad one off the shoulder. Life would be so much better. In fact, the fourth beatitude, that's what it means. I hunger and thirst to have the other thing kicked off my shoulder so I can just be right and do right without any more inner turmoil. Jesus said, that person's blessed. Because they're hungry and thirsty to be right in my eyes. And there's coming a day where they will be. Because I'm going to kick that other thing off their shoulder forever. That's what we lost, y'all. That's what we lost. Compared to that, don't you think Jesus' assessment of our bankruptcy is accurate? We don't live in a world like that anymore. We're at odds with God's creation. You know, we're fighting whether you believe in it or not or whatever. You know, the warming of the earth and the melting of the glaciers and the deforestation of God's creation, the way that we work the land and how it's creating food crisis and our pursuit for money and how I don't want to get too deep down that some of you are like, you're losing me, Pastor. Okay, I'll come back. I would just say we, we're destroying God's creation because of our sinful appetites. How about our relationship with each other? You know what they didn't have in the Garden of Eden? A prison system, jails, bullies, fences, Simply safe systems. Are you thinking where I'm thinking? Look how far we've fallen. Wouldn't it be nice to live in a kingdom where you could leave the doors open at night? Where your neighbor is looking out for you and you're looking out for them. Where it's not about fighting for your rights and your property. You're just happy to live in communion and unity together. Wouldn't you like to take walks with the Lord? I hope some of you do. Get to know him enough that you'd like to take a walk with him. <laughs> We're spiritually bankrupt because of what we've lost. And here's the problem. Once you realize that, what's worse is that you recognize, oh, no, I can't dig my way out of that. I can't bridge the breach through anything that I do anymore. Jesus says, blessed are you if you have an ever-increasing awareness of that. And you're thinking, but I don't get it. Well, here's why. Here's why that's blessed. Let me show you. If you experience that feeling, if you've ever thought about that, if, if you've come to that conclusion, you know what that means? That is concrete evidence that the Holy Spirit led you to that conclusion, says the Bible. You didn't get there on your own. Jesus said, I'm not leaving you disciples here. I'm going to go away. But it's good for you that I go away because when I leave, I'm handing the baton, my paraphrase, I'm handing the baton off to somebody else. I'm sending another counselor to you. He won't just be with you. He will be in you. Well, now, Jesus, that was one thing he couldn't do. He could be in one place at one time with this group of disciples. But if he's thinking about going worldwide with this Christianity thing, that was going to limit. He said, I'm sending someone who will be in you. And here's what he will do. He will convict the world with an awareness of their ever-increasing understanding of their spiritual poverty. That's where the salvation process begins, my friend. You don't skip right to forgiveness. There's a process that happens inside of us. And Jesus is saying, you know what? The Christian life begins 
with an ever-increasing awareness, I am bankrupt and I can't earn my way into relationship with Jesus. The only shot I have is grace. I can't come to the counter and be like, Jesus, listen, I realize there's a debt on my bill here, but I'm good for it and I can pay it off. You need to make it right. You need to accept my payment because I've got a Marriott rewards card right here and you need to process that and give me the key so I can get into my room. Jesus says that's a person who thinks they're wealthy. That's the person who says, like the Pharisees, do you think the Pharisees spent one moment thinking they were spiritually bankrupt? They walked around saying, I do everything right. I'm right and holy. I'm better than everybody else, and therefore I'm right with God. That's someone who thinks they can pay their own bill off. Jesus says, blessed are you when you realize you're indebted with a debt you can't pay that is rightfully assigned to you, that you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and what you deserve, your wage, your wage, what you've earned is death, and your only hope is a gift. Why is that so good? Because it's the evidence of the Holy Spirit saving ministry working within us and preparing us for what comes next. Any type of recovery ministry will tell you it starts with some level of admitting and confession. When I counsel with people and they say, I'm in this problem, I'm in this situation, I need some counsel, I need some advice. I can tell you usually by the end of 45 minutes whether, we have op- whether I'm optimistic about moving forward. And what I'm looking for is does this person have any clue of their culpability in whatever problem this is? Do they at least confess, you know what, I confess I'm a little bit difficult to live with sometimes when provoked. Okay, that's not a full confession, but we're getting there. I recognize that because of my choices here that I injected into this relationship, there's a role I play in this. I recognize, I confess, I agree with the facts. I can't help, we can't help, and the Lord must wait on those of us who can't even do that. We want to skip right past to confessing there's anything broken to just being absolved. Well, that's insincere. How can you apply for forgiveness for a debt you don't think you have? Think about that. I don't agree that I have a debt, but I'll take the forgiveness. That's not how it works. Salvation doesn't bypass us having to own and wrestle with our spiritual bankruptcy. You know why? Because until you think you're bankrupt, you would never go to the judge and ask for mercy. I'm not bankrupt financially. I'm not going to court on Monday to ask the judge to have mercy on my indebtedness. I don't need a judge to get me out of bankruptcy when I'm not bankrupt. You will not cling to a savior until you recognize if I jump in the pool, I can't swim. You won't cling to Jesus with the type of devotional love if you just think he's an add-on to your good behavior. You have to cling to him like someone who recognizes, I was bankrupt, but you took me in, and you not only forgave me and put it on my record for seven years, you covered the record in blood, and you gave me wealth in heaven. That's where it starts, and that's why he says, blessed are you if you're on a trajectory that begins by saying, I recognize my spiritual bankruptcy. Because the only way you're aware of that is the Holy Spirit making you aware, and then you have to decide what you're doing with it. Second, it's through that discovery that the Holy Spirit leads us to Jesus. He leads you to the judge. You say, oh, I'm so bankrupt. I'm not right with God. I need to, I need to lower myself before him. And that leads you to the next beatitude we'll get to. Third, it's because of the promise that the, I'm sorry, I should have typed out kingdom of heaven. I just copied and pasted my notes. That means kingdom of heaven, K-O-H. It's because there's a promise the person who recognizes their ever in, they have an ever increasing awareness of their own spiritual bankruptcy it says they will be they will receive the kingdom of heaven theirs is the kingdom of heaven it belongs to you now and forever in other words my favorite summary of all of this if you know you're poor in spirit you're really not poor at all it's a knowing not a receiving okay it's a knowing not an achieving it's a knowing not a possession can't tell if you got it or not but we got to move to the next one What does it mean to mourn? I think you know this. One of my favorite quotes that I came across on this was, mourning begins when the tears end. For some of us, grief doesn't hit 
as deeply as it, uh, as it does others in different situations. You can grieve on this earth over the death of a loved one. You can grieve on this earth over the failure of a relationship. You can grieve on this earth over the loss of an opportunity. That is not what Jesus is describing here. He is not saying that it is blessed and you should consider yourself extra happy and you should dismiss the grieving process that he gives you, that he built into us as human beings to be resilient when we grieve and when we deal with loss. That's not what he's talking about. Those feelings you're walking through there are appropriate and healthy, and you need to just not get stuck on one of those stages. You need to keep moving through those. He's talking about a different kind of grief. It's a grief that comes on the heels of the first beatitude. If you recognize, I'm on my own, I am spiritually bankrupt. It leads naturally to a grief over your bankruptcy. And you say, because here's the difference. The first one, Beatitude, talks about confession. If I recognize I'm spiritually bankrupt. But how do I know if I'm a Christian? What did that realization do to you? How did you respond to it? Did you deny? Did you justify? Did you ignore? Did you pacify? Did you try and deal with it through some other means? Did your awareness of your own spiritual bankruptcy lead you down some different road? Or on the heels of it, did it lead you to a place I would call contrition? That says, because there's a person that says, you know what? Yeah, I said it. You deal with it. That's confession without contrition. How helpful is that? Yep. I said it. That's just the way I am. Confession without contrition. Here's what this one says. I am bankrupt. I am guilty. And I'm grieved over that. When I think about that, I don't feel indifferent. I don't feel neutral. I don't feel defensive. I feel grieved to my core because it's settling in. I am guilty. And I am in and of myself unable to repair the broken relationship between me and God, me and myself, me and my friends, me and my family, me and my enemies, me and God's creation. I am starting to come to terms with how much damage my sin has caused all of those relationships. And it's a weight almost too heavy to bear. I grieve. I mourn perpetually over it. And even after I'm saved, I recognize there's still sin in my body. And just that awareness makes me grieve and mourn and long for the day when that's not in me any longer. It's a grief that flows from a discovery that we're unable on our own to be and do what God wants us to be and do. I I would imagine, whether you've ever recognized it on this, that this is familiar to a lot of you. You've had moments or seasons of your life where you let your mind and your heart go into this space. If you've been there, can I testify to you from someone who, for about 18 months, that was my diet of my life. I don't want to open that up too wide for everybody, but there is a season of my life, thank God, now over 20 years ago, Where I was brought unapologetically and unavoidably to have to confront the fact that I was, in fact, spiritually bankrupt. Saved. Believe on my way to heaven. But a lot of that basis was on my own performance. And I thought my good performance would somehow wash away all my bad choices. And the Lord humbled me and brought me to the brink of just absolute relational vocational, mental, emotional, spiritual bankruptcy, and I had to have all those things stripped away from me to really see my deficit. And once I got to the place where I could come to at least terms of admitting to it fully, the grief was almost unbearable. Because I looked inside of me and I said, man, I, there's no good thing in me at all. This type of grief doesn't mean looking at yourself and saying, I have no value. I am not important. I'm not worth living. That's a lie from the pits of hell. That's not what this means. It means a deep dissatisfaction with the sin in me. And a deep dissatisfaction with being disconnected from God as a result of my sin. And it says, I know there's a better me that I should be, that I can't be. And there's better things that I should do, that I can't do. And I grieve over that. 
And then Jesus says, but that person should be supremely happy. Not in those feelings, but why? How can a person like that be blessed? Let's look at the, how, how, what does it mean to be blessed if you mourn? It's evidence. When you feel those feelings, you have those experiences, it's evidence confirming there's a spiritual work of God going on in your heart. You would not feel dissatisfied with your sin if the Holy Spirit didn't enlighten you to that. It's part of the way that God saves us because first he shows us our true condition that creates in you a hopelessness and despair that only God can satisfy. And then you will turn to a savior. You will cling to him in a way that people don't cling to him if they don't think they need him. That God is a luxury, not a necessity. That he's insurance, not a necessity. That he is an add on. I have everything already, but I want to add Jesus on to that so I've got the full benefits package of everything this life has to offer. That's not a saving relationship. A saving relationship says, Jesus, I confess that I'm spiritually bankrupt, and you need to know I don't like that. I grieve over that. I look at the natural consequences of my choices in my life. And when I think about that, I grieve. But Jesus, that doesn't drive me from you. It draws me to you because you offer me hope. You offer me wholeness. You offer me healing. You pronounce blessing on me because those, in, those things in me are things that are not the basis for my salvation. But they drive me down. They guide me down this pathway of knowing you better. And unless and until we come to those realizations, we won't fully experience the blessed life because it forms our character at a base level that allows you to relate to God and relate to yourself and relate to others and relate to creation the way kingdom citizens do. And why can they relate to one another and to God that way? Because they've come to these realizations and they've come impoverished to the Lord. And he has fed us and he has clothed us and he has made us new. It's evidence confirming that spiritual mourning is not the basis of salvation. It's the sign of life that God has begun a good work. I used this illustration earlier. A way to understand this is, you know, when some of you have had this experience, I have had this experience twice of being in the room when my wife delivered our two children. I had the much easier job of the two of us. Trust me, I realize that. Both of our boys, you know, came in the world different ways. I'll spare you the details. But, you know, one took a long time. The other one came in really quickly. But with both of the boys, when they were delivered, I remember the doctors and the nurses looking for a specific sign to let us know that everything was okay. They wanted the, each boy, that when they came in the world, to do something to give us a, a, a signal that everything was good. You know what it was? They wanted the babies to do what? They wanted them to cry. Now, how sick is that? Think about that for a second. The babies are like, oh, I'm cold. It's different. It's, there's a lot more room to wiggle around. I don't know where I'm at. But they're crying out, whatever. They're crying because they're in some form of, form of you know, duress or scared. or fear. You know, your doctors are going to send me emails later and tell me I got it all wrong. Just work with me for a second, right? And the rest of us in the room, we're celebrating while they're crying. Do you understand this a little better? The crying, we're not happy that they were in duress or afraid. The crying was a signal that new life had begun. Our mourning, not over lost opportunities or lost love, our mourning over our sinful bankrupt, our, our spiritual bankruptcy, our grief with that, pushes us away from that bankruptcy and says, I want to come to the Lord for that slate to be wiped clean. It's not the crying that he says is blessed. The crying is an indication of new life beginning in our heart that moves it towards Christ. And there's a promise. Jesus promises those of us who grieve over our sinful condition, you're really blessed because guess what? There's going to come a point where you won't grieve over your sinful condition anymore because he will remove your sinful flesh from you forever. And you'll... In heaven, in God's kingdom, in the perfection of his kingdom, we're back to the original plan. You don't have this filthy imagination to have to deal with all the time. You don't have this. You don't have these wandering desires of your heart. You don't have the pride. You don't have the bad neighbors. You don't have the protection. You don't have, the, you don't have any of those evil instincts that eat away at us. God will deliver us. What comfort that will be for all of us when we have that. I've got to let me wrap it up with this one because this is the hard one for me to understand. What does it mean to be meek? Not necessarily a word I aspire to have assigned to me because it sounds too much like weak. I think about like a little tiny mouse walking around just being meek. And that's not what the word means at all. It's hard to describe that word in our English language. It's really, we think powerless doormats that walk around letting people run roughshod over us. That's not what meek means at all because Jesus was meek and he was nobody's doormat. Meek means power under control. 
A person who is meek, I'll give you some more word salad here, is someone who has learned to accept, they've come to terms with, the natural consequences of their own doings with grace and humility. Now let me stop there for a second. This doesn't mean, Pastor, are you saying that people just come to the point where they say, you know what, I'm a sinner, I sin, NBD, no big deal. I sin, I get grace, I sin, I get grace. I don't need to be stressed about that anymore. No, that's not, Paul says, don't think that way. You don't ever, a Christian is someone who mourns over the fact that there's sin in their heart at all, and they don't come to a place where they say, I'm just cool with that, and so I'm just going to live a sinful life and be okay with it so that I can get grace. He's saying, he's actually talking about a mental place of healing from the realization that you're a sinner. Here's what it looks like. It looks like you have come to terms with the natural consequences of sinful choices you've made with your life and that you no longer allow those unhealthy feelings towards yourself to dictate the rest of your life. You've accepted the fact that you are a sinner who's been saved by grace, that that's who you were, that's not who you are, and you don't walk with arrogance because of that. You walk with a new humility that only comes from saying, I have been humbled by who I was, and I recognize the only reason I can walk with confidence is because of Jesus, not because of me. Therefore, I live a meek life. I'm not all about protecting my rights and my name anymore. A meek person says, you know what, if we're in a bit of a, a, a kerfuffle, or oh, well, I would use kerfuffle, I need to look that up, make sure that I use it right. I wasn't in my notes. I used to think that was the popcorn. That's a kernel. But I, did I use that right? Those of you that know English better than I do? Okay. Oh, you said, yeah, I'm kind of like, you look down at me. I didn't really. If you're in a, you're, you're just not getting along with somebody. And there's a way to just make peace. And it might involve you saying, you know what? If I can just lower what I think, if I just don't have to defend my rights or my name or my place in this, if I can just, let go of that, this is going to be resolved just like that. A meek person will do that. Because at the end of the day, they're like, you know what? I don't need to be all that. It's not what it's all about. It's kind of like the person Jesus is describing at the end of the sermon, when, or no, in chapter 5, when he's doing the whole section on, you've heard that it's been said, but I say, that's a fun one to walk through. Wait till you'll all be here on the week we talk about divorce. I know right now, you're going to be here to be like, let's see how he gets out of this one. I think I'm out of town that week, and uh, we're going to give that one a chance. No, I've made sure that I was in town that week to, to handle that. But how can you be the type of person Jesus describes in a few paragraphs where he says, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, Turn to them also the other, and you're like, uh-uh, that's being a doormat. He says, no, that's being meek. Now, I'm not going to get the whole way to do the spoiler alert and tell you what all that was that he was going into. But it's not less than when someone slaps you on the right cheek and does you wrong, you think, I have a right to hit him back. What if you could just say, you know what, hit me on the other one too. It's not about my name. It doesn't say hit me on the other one. It says turn to them the other cheek. Something about the turning to them might cause that person to change their desire to want to hit your other eye. What if someone sues you to get your coat and you're like, I could go to court and fight and win. But what if I just say, you know what, take my shirt too. What might happen to the trajectory of that court case? If someone forces you to go with them one mile, you say, you know what, I'm going to go beyond that and go too. I can't live like that. You can if you're meek. Meek doesn't mean weak. It means you have power. But it's under control because you live with an awareness of who you were, who you are, and who's responsible for who you are. And you walk in a confidence of that that doesn't need to go around justifying yourself and proving yourself and fighting for your right. You're just like, that stuff has all been settled and therefore I can live meekly. But a meek person also says this, I will lower my rights or my name to make peace. But if you cross my Savior, I am immovable. Power under control. I don't have time. Oh, you know what? I've got a minute. Worship team, come back. I can do this last one in a minute. I think it makes sense. Because watch the progression. This is beautiful. I think I did a terrible injustice to this. I hope that the Holy Spirit can help you see this. Watch what Jesus is saying. Blessed is the one who recognizes that they're in spiritual poverty. For it will lead them on a path of inheriting the kingdom of God. 
Blessed is the person who, after they realize they're spiritually bankrupt, say, I'm grieved over my spiritual condition. I can't be left like this. Because that will lead them to the forgiving power of Jesus. And the person who's forgiven by Jesus is given a new humility that's evidenced in meekness. And why are you blessed if you're meek? It's the evidence of God working on you. Here's what it's doing. It's also building in you one of the requirements for citizens in the new kingdom. Because meekness is going to allow you to relate to others in such a way that you really can love one another as you love yourself. Because you're not all going around fighting for your rights. And if the whole, it's hard to do when you're the only one that's meek. But when every citizen in the whole kingdom is two things. We recognize that all of us are ultimately devoted to God. That will never be interrupted. And if we all recognize that at the end of the day, we just want to live in peace and harmony with one another, it won't be challenged. It prepares you with the type of character that will allow you to inherit the kingdom of God. You live and you walk with the meekness. Notice he didn't say blessed are the meek because you don't start there. Meekness is the evidence of the Holy Spirit working in you after we've grieved over our, sinful, over our spiritual bankruptcy that we realized in the first beatitude. You see how it builds on it. You recognize I'm spiritually poor. What does that do? If I listen to it, it draws me to Jesus because I'm grieved over it. Then he starts working in my life. I confess my sins. I repent of those sins. I recognize I've done wrong. And he forgives us. And you know what happens after that is a new appetite starts growing inside of you for hunger and righteousness. Or appetite for hunger. What does that even mean? An appetite to hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's the last beatitude we were going to look at today. All that simply means is this, is you just simply want to live a life of being right and doing right before the Lord and you want nothing else and anything that interferes with that frustrates you. And you recognize this throughout your spiritual journey. A lot of my prayers really boil down are like Jesus. I think a lot of times we spend our prayer time and we have to. We have to confess the sins that we did. And we just say, Lord, I, I can't wait till my interactions with you don't have to be so much of me just emptying out all the stuff that I've done. I can't wait until that's not, that's an issue that's not even in my heart anymore. You know what Paul, like Romans 7, awesome chapter to relate to. As he's writing the Bible, which he's probably not aware of he's writing the Bible. He's writing a letter to a church in Rome that he's never been to. And he dumps out in chapter 7, I'm, he, my paraphrasing is, I am grieved over what I see inside of my own heart. I'm supposed to want to do right and be right. But you know what I want to do? Wrong. Sinful things. And he says, I see two different appetites in me. One appetite that should be weak wants to do wrong. And one appetite that should be strong but is actually weak is the one that wants to do right. And he goes back and forth. He says, you know, the things I should want to do, I don't want to do. The things I shouldn't want to do, I still want to do. And you can, he is frustrated. He is mourning. He is grieving. And he finally says, who will rescue me from this? And he doesn't ever, he just says, thank be to God through Jesus Christ. So in that, you hear what it sounds like to be that person doesn't mean he wasn't saved. It just means when I look inside of me, I still don't look inside of me and say, oh, what a great person I am. I look inside of me and say, outside of Jesus, there's no good thing in me, but in him, I am right. In him, I am saved. Through him and through him only, I am meek. Through him, I have a new appetite to be right before the good. It just means I'm not satisfied to keep coming to God in my sinful state. I hunger and thirst for a day where all that sin will just be Right click, copied, and deleted right out of me. And he says, you're blessed because one day you're going to be full of righteousness and only righteousness. So how do I know if I'm a true Christian? Have you had those experiences? Do you know those things? Do you believe that they're true of us? Do you believe you're spiritually bankrupt? Do you know you're spiritually bankrupt? What have you done with that awareness? Has it led you to a point of grieving and mourning, mourning that was only resolved through confession and forgiveness? Since you've been forgiven by Jesus and saved, do you see the Holy Spirit growing you in the area of meekness? Do you recognize an appetite in you not to be seen doing all your good deeds like the Pharisees, but an appetite to be right before the Lord? That's what it means to be a true Christian. If you identify with those feelings and experiences, don't look down at yourself. 
Don't think, oh, but pastor, sometimes those things are painful. Yeah, just like the baby crying is painful, but it's signs of life and God doesn't leave you there. Those experiences that you have are either going to put you in a place where you push God away, you find your own way around it, or you just surrender to what the Holy Spirit's doing in your life and it leads you in the path of the kingdom. We'll look at those other ones next week. Let me pray over you. Heavenly Father, we confess to you. I confess for me, and I believe as a representative of this people, we're going to just confess a few things you write now, Lord, and um, we're spiritually bankrupt. We understand we're debtors to you. And because of that, we don't have any rights. We can't come to your check-in counter and just demand a room based on our resume or based on our ability to pay. We're just informed enough and aware enough to understand we are in debt over our ears to you. But boy, do we want a, a space in your kingdom and the relationship with you. We're not proud of the fact that we're spiritually bankrupt. We're not content with that. And we're not okay to keep going through life feeling a disconnect between us and you. We want to know you. We acknowledge that we're sinful, but we grab on to the good news that Jesus, you knew we're sinful. You knew there was only one way out, and that was to pay off our debt. You knew we couldn't, and so you did. You stepped up and laid down your perfect life. Your dad accepted your payment and processed that payment, processed that payment for all mankind in perpetuity if we would but simply come to you in our bankruptcy, in our grief over our condition, and turn our eyes to you that we would be meek and bow low before you and just simply say in all humility, we need to be forgiven. We want to be forgiven. Have mercy on us. We're sinners. Lord, we recognize new appetites growing in us. Not necessarily to be wealthy or driven or creative, but an appetite to be right and do right before you. Not only that, but to want to do right. And to want that even our wants, our desires, our cravings, and our passions would be redeemed. So that rather than having to fight against our passions and desires that drag us away from you, our passions and desires would point us toward you. And even when we put those things under a microscope, we see how flawed we still can be. But Lord, there's a hunger and thirst inside of us to be right and do right according to your standards. Will you help us? For the one that's watching, listening, to maybe the one that's here this morning, would you like to come into Jesus' kingdom today? Enter through him. Say, Pastor, I'm not righteous. I can't achieve it. Righteousness is not a what, it's a who. Jeremiah 23 says, G, says he has become our righteousness. It's just a who. It's a Jesus. Jesus is your righteousness. He wants to impute, to impart, to give you his righteousness. But he needs to trade with you. You have to trade your dirtiness for his righteousness. You have to lay that before him. And he'll take that. And in exchange, he'll give you his righteousness. Pastor, that's not fair. Hallelujah, you're right. God's kingdom is not about fairness because we don't want what we deserve. God's kingdom is about grace. And that's where we get according to his character and according to his desires, not our performance. So if you're ready to enter his kingdom today, do you believe? Do you believe that you need to be saved? Do you believe Jesus can save you? Do you believe he will save you? And are you ready to acknowledge him as your king? to repent, to turn away from you being your king and allow him to lead a whole new and different way of living that will begin inside of you and radiate to the outside. If that's yes to those things, you are ready to be saved right now in the same way that even our worship leader led his brother-in-law to Jesus just a couple weeks ago on the phone late at night. You can pray that same prayer today. Confess that right now to Jesus in your own words. If you need some guidance, you can pray a simple prayer, Jesus. I admit I'm spiritually bankrupt. I have sinned. I can't pay off my debt to you. I'm not okay with that. I want us to be restored to right relationship again. So please forgive me for my sins. 
I believe in you, Jesus, and everything the Bible tells me about you. I believe the way you lived and the way you died and the way you rose again is exactly the way the Bible says. Because of that, I have confidence that I can come to you now and you'll hear me. So I open my heart to you. You're the king. I'm not. I turn away from leading my life and I turn to you. Please come and live inside of me. Change me on the inside. And let those changes radiate out in the way that I live. Thank you for saving me. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you're saved. I just ask you one brave thing to do. This is not a requirement for your salvation. It's literally just something Phil Nauer is asking you to consider doing. I'm going to count to three. And if you prayed that prayer with me, just ask you to be brave enough. Lift up your hand. Make eye contact with me. You can put your hand right down. All I want to do is acknowledge that decision you made and celebrate with you this morning. Anyone pray with me today? One, two, three. Anybody pray with me this morning? Quick look here. Thank you, Jesus. All right, everybody, if you're willing and able, will you open your eyes and lift up your heads? Will you stand with me this morning? I hope you can leave here today feeling confident that you're saved because you recognize, Pastor, I've come to those conclusions. They're not great conclusions, but I've come to them, and I can see what Jesus was saying. They've led me on a path of walking closer to Jesus. I want you to walk out of here with that confidence. I don't want you to go to bed tonight wondering like, oh, am I one of those people that's going to show up thinking I'm getting in when I'm not? If you recognize your need for Jesus, if you recognize you're poor, you're not poor at all. You are wealthy beyond your imagination. Blessed are you. So I want you to grab onto that today and take hope from that this morning. Here's where we're going to close our time together. We're going to do a couple things. We're going to give together this morning. So if you would like to give tithes, offerings, missions, outreach, give you an opportunity to do that. Secondly, we're going to pray for you. If you would like prayer at all, our prayer team is coming. I'll make myself available as well. I'll be over here as we begin to sing in just a moment. If you'd like prayer, come to one of us. We'd be happy to pray with you. We're going to sing this song of worship to the Lord, and then Pastor James is going to come share one closing thought with you and dismiss you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you're so good to us. In fact, we turn that to you right now. Thank you for seeing us and saying that we're blessed. Thank you for allowing us to experience a supreme kind of happiness that can only come from knowing that we are loved, we are forgiven, that we can come to terms with the natural consequences of our past and not be imprisoned by those anymore, that we can have true healing, not just spiritually. You can heal our minds from the scars of the way we used to think about ourselves. You can heal our emotions from the damage we've done to ourselves because of sin. You treat us holistically, body, soul, and spirit. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. We look forward to the day in your kingdom where we won't have to fight sin any longer, where we won't have to wrestle against the principalities and powers of darkness. But until that day, help us to rise up and be your kids that we will gain a reputation for having characteristics of our dad. We thank you for all these things in the matchless name of Christ. Amen. I will tell of your wonders and sing of your grace. The God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. Your mercy is mighty, age after age, and all generations bow down and praise the Lord.
God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday. in the place where we recognized our hopeless state, our spiritual bankruptcy, and when we threw ourselves at your feet and threw ourselves upon your mercy that you didn't turn us away, but that you took the payment through your death on the cross and you applied that to our account. Thank you for doing a work that we could never do. Thank you for not turning us away when we needed you. Thank you for bringing us into your kingdom, for giving us brand new life. Thank you for continuing that work in us. Lord, let us never, ever be satisfied with sin in our lives. Let us never be satisfied with those parts of our heart that, that are dark, that we try to, to hide from you. But Holy Spirit, shine your light on those places in our lives. And even though that's uncomfortable, Lord, I pray that that continues to, to draw out of us a, a dissatisfaction with the ways in our life in which we are not like you. And that that drives us to surrender in a greater way to your spirit so that we can become more like you. Help us to look more like you this week in our words in our actions, in our thoughts, in the way that we speak, in the way that we live. In your name we pray, amen. I'm thankful for what the Lord is doing here. Um, just one big thing to remind you of, and Pastor Phil already invited you, so I'll just come behind and offer another invitation to join us next week for Friends and Family Day at 9 and 11 a.m. and for Echo Eats immediately right after the service. Lots of good stuff going on this week. Growth groups, axe throwing on Saturday. And then you get to hang out with us, hear some stories, and eat some food on Sunday. So we would invite you to join us for those things. If you need information on any of them, you can... Uh, go talk to someone at the info booth or me. I'll be out there in the foyer as well. May God bless you as you go this week. And uh, we'll be praying that you have an awesome time enjoying his presence. Thank you for worshiping with us.